Hello and welcome to the first of our talks on biostatistics. This will be a uh, just a, a talk on some of the basic measurements uh, that we use in statistics. Um, a lot of students do not study biostatistics and epidemiology for the test just because it's so low yield, but I think that can be a, uh, a big error because there are there, there are probably about, I would say, somewhere between 1 and 5% of your questions will be uh, biostatistics or epidemiology related. And the questions are generally pretty straightforward on the test. And so these are some easy questions that you can get right and, and really build on your score. And, you know, with these questions, you either know it or you don't. So if you don't study for this and you get these questions, you're going to get them wrong if, if you don't uh, know what, what you're doing. It's really hard to wing these questions. So I recommend uh, getting to know these concepts pretty well. If you haven't had the opportunity yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. If you'd consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos free. Thank you very much in advance. So we're going to keep this pretty short. We're going to look at measures of location and measures of spread. These are going to be very important concepts as we build on this uh, and get a little bit further into statistics. As you know, uh, the reason that the USMLE likes to test this stuff is because as a physician, as a healthcare professional, you need to be able to read and keep up with the latest evidence-based medicine. And a lot of that uses statistics to back up uh, what it's talking about. So you need to know what a 95% confidence interval is. You need to know what standard deviation is. You need to know this stuff in order to really read these papers and understand what they're talking about. So we're going to, this is a very good place to start. We're going to talk about some of these really basic concepts and then we'll build on this as time goes on. So we're going to talk about measures of location and measures of spread, and you'll get an idea of what those are as, as we go. So the mean is a measure of location, and a mean is very simple. A mean is simply the average value of a set of variables. So you've taken averages before. You have a set of values. You add them up together, and then you divide them by the number of values that you've got. So this is a mathematical way of expressing that. You may see a mean expressed as an x with a little uh, line over it, or you may see it uh, described as the Greek letter mu. Uh, either or, they are slightly different depending on whether you're referring to a sample or a population at large, but that's really beyond the scope here. So all you're doing here is you're taking the sum of your variables from your first variable all the way up to your final variable, and then you're dividing it by the total number of variables you have. So let's just do a quick practice here. So here you have 24 variables. They're just random numbers. I could have given you anything. I could have given you temperatures. I could have given you uh, anything, uh, birth weights, etc. And so um, all you would do is you would take these numbers, add them up, and then divide them by 24 since there's 24 numbers. And so there you go, 4 plus 8 plus 9 plus 7 all the way to 12 and then divide by 24 and you have your mean, 7.04. Now this mean is going to be very important because there's a lot of things you can do with this mean, especially as we get on towards looking at, uh, at variation and standard deviation. Now the median is the middle value in a set of variables. So this is very simple. All we do is we line our numbers, our variables up in numerical order, and then it's the middle number that is the, uh, the median. So if you have three variables, it's the second uh, number. If you have five variables, it's the third. Now, those are good for odd numbers of variables, but what, let's say you have an even number of variables, and there, there really isn't a middle variable because you have two and then you know, nothing in between, right? So if you had, let's say, four variables, where's that middle variable? Well, if the number of variables is even, then you'll take those middle two variables and you'll average the two of them together. So let's do an example here. Uh, so it's pretty simple if you have an odd number, right? You just find that middle number. But here we you see you have an even number of variables. And you may want to know this for the test because they may throw this at you. Uh, because getting a median is pretty simple. But what if you have an even number? So here we have an even number of 24 variables. And we'll line them up here in numerical order. And where is our middle variable? You can pause it and look for your middle variable. And as you know, we have an even number of variables. So there isn't a middle. There's a, a middle two. 
And so our middle two, uh, if you do the counting here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. So these are our middle two. They're 7 and 7, so the average is going to be 7. Now if the middle two are 7 and 8, then the median would be 7.5. So you just take the average of the middle two. All right? So that's our median. The mode is the value that appears most frequently. So that's pretty simple. You just look on your table and find the value that shows up the most frequently. Now you can have more than one mode, certainly. Uh, so here five comes up five times, that's the most. But if let's say four came up five times too, then you would have two modes, you'd have four and five. And what do we call that? We call that bimodal, and you've probably seen a bimodal distribution, and that's where you have two high points on your curve, and th those high points just mean that those values show up the most. And I'll show you a picture of a bimodal distribution. So this is the mode 5 here. Notice that it's not, uh, the mode does not have to be the same as the median or the same as the mean. You can have uh, different modes and medians and means. We're going to look at uh, when you look at the standard bell curve, the median mode and uh, and and uh, the mean, median, and mode are all going to be the same number, uh, but it doesn't have to be like that. So our our mode here is five. So here you can see a standardized bell curve. Uh, this is a normal distribution, uh, and, and let's say that this number here is zero. It doesn't have to be. This is going to be the mean. Why is it the mean? Because it's the average. If you take all these numbers and add them up and divide them by the total uh, numbers you've got, we don't see a, an axis here, uh, but you would uh, see that this, this area here is, is the mean. Uh, this is also the mode because this uh, has the highest probability of showing up. Okay, so this is the, the highest point, meaning that it shows up the most. And it is also the median, because it's right in the middle of our distribution. This is bimodal here. So you can see that here's our mean and median. It's right in the middle, and it's the average. Uh, but you have two modes here. These are the ones that show up the most. So your mode is just going to be your highest point uh, on your distribution curve. Okay, the range now, so we're, now we're getting into spread. And spread is just looking at uh, variations and, and differences. The, the range is the difference between the largest and smallest values in a data set. So up until now, we've been talking about points. Now we're talking about ranges and, and, and how these points on the curve relate to one another. The range is the difference between the largest and smallest values in a data set. So this is pretty simple. We know that the smallest number that shows up is 4, and we know that the biggest number that shows up is 12, and so to compute your range, you just determine the difference, and that's 12 minus 4, so your range is 8. That's pretty straightforward. Now we can get a little bit more complicated here, and we'll talk about the interquartile range. Now the regular old range doesn't tell us a whole lot because you might just have one value that's four, kind of an outlier, one value that's 12, a little high, that's kind of an outlier, and, and that gives you a really big range, but that might not tell you the whole picture. Let's say you have a bunch of values that are seven, and then you have one value that's four and one value that's 12. So you still have a range of eight, but that doesn't tell you uh, the fact that you've got all of these values that are clustered around seven, and then you have a couple outliers. A range is very sensitive to outliers. The interquartile range helps us get around that. So the interquartile range is the difference between the value that's at the 75th percentile, which is quartile 3, and the value that is at the 25th percentile, which is quartile 1. So how do we determine what's at the 75th percentile and what's at the 25th percentile? So here we have our numbers again. And you'll want to line these all up in numerical order. And here's how I like to do this. Now there's formulas you can use, but I like to keep it simple. So the first thing you do is find your uh, median. And we've already done that. Your median is right here. And your median is going to be your second quartile. So this is the 50th percentile. That's the median by definition. Then what you can do is put the rest of the values in parentheses. So all the values to the left, put in parentheses and all the values to the right you put in parentheses. And then what you do is you find the median for both of those. So the median in our first set of parentheses is 5, and so this is going to correspond to the first quartile, 
and the median in the second set of parentheses is 9. Uh, so this is the third quartile. And then all you do is you take the difference, and that's 9 minus 5, and so our interquartile range is 4. Okay, so that's a smaller range than we had uh, with our regular range, and the interquartile range is a little bit more uh, accurate to the distribution, whereas the regular range uh, is very sensitive to outliers. Okay, this is really important. So as we go on and talk about statistics, it's very important that you know about variance and standard deviation because it's going to come up again and again. So the variance is a measure of the spread of the data around the mean. So the smaller variance you have, the more the data is clustered around the mean. The more variance you have, the more spread out it is. So here again are our values. And the variance, and this is kind of overwhelming, but I'll just break this down. So the variance is described as either S or sigma, depending on whether you're dealing with a population or a sample. Here we're, we're just talking about dealing with a sample here. And that's what you'll be given on the test. Uh, so this is the formula you want to remember. And all it is, is you're taking the, uh, the, the value and subtracting the mean and then squaring it. Why do you have to square it? Well, if you didn't square it and you just added up the each of these values minus the mean, you would get zero. So you have to square it. And uh, what this will give you is a, a, a measurement of how spread out the data is. So the higher or the lower the number is, the, the further it is removed away from the mean, the higher the variance is going to be. So as you can see, if, if, if our uh, value for each of these points is further from the mean, then when you square it, it's going to give you a higher value, whether it's negative or positive. When you square it, it's going to give you a positive number. All right, so the, the further away your data points are away from the mean, the higher the variance is going to be. And that makes sense. If the data is clustered around the mean, very close to the mean, you're going to have a low variance. If it's further away from the mean, you're going to have a, a, a larger variance. So all you would do here is you would take and you go through with each of these. You won't be given anything like this on the test. You'll just need to know what variance is. Uh, so you take your, your value here, 4, subtract the mean, which is 7.04, and then square it. And that gives you negative 3.04 squared, which is 9.24. You'll always get a positive number. And then you, you just go through. This is the way you do it. You go through and work it for each of them. I go all the way down. And then what you do then, the sigma means that you sum them up from the first variable all the way to the final variable. And then you divide it by the number of variables minus one. And there's an explanation for that, but I'm not going to get into it. So you sum up all of these over 23, and then you get your number, and that's 5.95, and that is your sample variance. Okay, so that's variance, and you'll want to know about variance because this is going to come up later on when we talk about more complicated concepts. Okay, so now we'll talk about standard deviation, and this is pretty simple. So standard deviation is, all it is, is the, it's the square root of the variance. So it measures a very similar uh, concept here. It's just, it's just a little bit different uh, insofar as the, the number we're getting. So the standard deviation is S. So like the variance is s squared, standard deviation is s. You're just taking the square root. And it, like variance, is a measure of the spread of the data around the mean. So a lower standard deviation, just like a lower variance, means that the data is going to be clustered around the mean. You're going to have a, a sharper peak. And a higher standard deviation indicates a flatter curve. You're going to have more dispersion. So all you do, and I don't have the values up here, but all you do to get standard deviations take the square root of the variance. And so you'll have a lower number, um, but uh, this is, uh, works out to be 2.44. And this is a very, very, very important number because what this is going to tell you is uh, it's going to give you all sorts of information as far as what the probability is of a given value falling in uh, a certain point on your curve. Uh, and so this is very, very important. It's also important for something we call the 95% confidence interval, which we'll talk about later on. Uh, but this is widely used in, in, in epidemiology and statistics. You've probably seen it in studies. Uh, and what the 95% confidence interval is, is it's a, a range that we say there's a 95% confidence that 
a, 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 a random value is going to fall within that range. And so you can see here that one standard deviation removed from, uh, from, from the mean, it's a 34.1% chance in either direction. So your chance of being one, uh, one standard deviation, and they do use sigma here, but you can also use s. Uh, your chance of being one standard deviation away from your mean in either direction is going to be 68.2%. If you go two standard deviations away in either direction, it's going to be slightly more than 95%. The point where we have 95% is actually 1.96 times the standard deviation. So whatever your standard deviation is times 1.96 gives you your 95% confidence interval. So for our 95% confidence interval that we uh, computed for our, our, our data, you just take the mean plus or minus 1.96 times the standard deviation. So our mean was 7.04 plus or minus 1.96 times our standard deviation of 2.44. If you subtract, you get 2.26. If you add, you get 11.82. You can see this is a very, very wide range. And if you did a bar graph of our of our data way back here, you would see you have a whoops. You'd see we have a very, very wide range here. And that was kind of told to you when we looked at our original range. Uh, you can see that we have a very wide range. I mean, we 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 have a range of eight. And that, that's pretty significant uh, when you're going only going all the way up to 12. So we have a very big variance uh, and standard deviation here, and that's going to mean that we're going to have a very wide confidence interval, very difficult to know where uh, it's, it's falling. Um, now, if you have a, a smaller confidence interval, uh, that means that you have more uh, a, a better idea of where things are falling. So as you can see, the higher the standard deviation is, or the higher the variance is, the wider your confidence interval is going to be. And so you have less of an idea of where things are going to fall. Um, now, you can do this for any uh, value. Uh, so uh, you can find out uh, where it lies, uh, or what, what the number is going to be that lies two standard deviations below or two standard deviations above, etc. And this is all going to come into uh, more clarity as we go on and talk about z, z values and uh, as we talk about uh, other things that use standard deviation and variance. Uh, so this will give you a good groundwork as we go on and talk about more advanced concepts in biostatistics, uh, but uh, this, this is going to be something you'll want to know frontwards and backwards uh, as, we, as we go on. Uh, so I will see you in our next talk.